our agenda says our application of Pledge of Allegiance uh, was to be done this morning by Councilman John Riggs. Remember, Councilman Riggs is running a little bit behind and should be here shortly. So I have asked Councilman Sam Jones to lead us in our application of Pledge. Councilman Jones. Let's pray. Now, Father, again, we want to say just thank you and start today by saying just thank you, Lord. And hallelujah, as we pray to you, Lord, and just the opportunity to come to the Statesboro Chambers to sit down together to reason for the citizens of Statesboro and all our guests, O oh Lord. We ask that you be with us, O oh Lord, and grant us serenity, courage, and wisdom as we set forth to do for, for one and for all. We just thank you and praise you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we just say thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord.
can see all the individual points and stormwater lines that were mapped as part of this project. And then within each individual point, this is all the information that is associated with an individual point for its location as well as its condition assessment. And then there are two attachments associated with each individual point that highlights an interior photo and an exterior one. To allow the crews as they reinvestigate sites as we, as they reinvestigate them throughout future years that allow them to see if things have changed significantly. Uh, in order to determine if there's been a, a major issue that will require some additional maintenance. So as a result of the condition assessment, we're able to uh, create a maintenance work program based off this <coughs> and developed a program for the city to follow to start to address some of these uh, conditional uh, issues. So the condition assessment we used to develop the work program and defined three major categories. First is operational issues, looking at sediment, debris, vegetation, and erosion issues. Second is capital maintenance issues that are more related to structural damage that the city crews can handle. And then the third is the capital improvement projects. And this was ones that require major drainage issues and an engineered solution. So I'm gonna focus initially on the operational issues, the presence of sediment, debris, vegetation, and erosion control. The first aspect of the maintenance work program. So these were the six operational maintenance categories identified through the condition assessment that we used to help planning the, the maintenance program, uh, looking at sediment, vegetation, channel, different types of erosion, and presence of debris. And based off these different uh, conditions for these, we prioritized ones that would require maintenance and then levels of priority. So the highest priority is there's only one indicated in red, and then the second highest priority are the ones in orange, and then the third priority level is those in yellow. So the proposal is for the city crews to go along at the highest priority conditions first, and then gradually going down to the next level of priority as they work to address all the operational maintenance issues across the city. So the city will still be addressing phone call initiated complaints related to stormwater, but as they start to address these ones identified in the drainage assessment, we'll be able to hopefully alleviate some of those future calls because we'll be starting to address other underlying issues that may be causing these. Are so those the actual numbers? Okay. Yeah, these are the actual numbers, the percentages of the 3,600 features. So for example, the 7,600% sediment, the 4.2% represents about 150 structures across the city that will have that condition. Is there a timeline on how long it will take to get from red to orange, orange to yellow, right? It depends on how fast uh, the crews are able to move with these, but we have a proposal for a route to, uh, to address these and then just allow them to kind of work through the city progressively <coughs> with the highest priority and then gradually working down. So an example of a proactive maintenance work order as we zoom into this one area on Dottie Simmons Way, uh, the dots highlighted in red are ones that have sediment issues greater than 76 to 100 percent. And then green, they're very tough to see because they're very small. Those ones don't have any issues. But as we're able to look in at the GIS database, we can see that this structure is pretty much indeed blocked with sediment, as is the other one downstream. So the, the work order for this one would be to remove that sediment and help with clearing the ditch uh, and grading it to help alleviate that and allow the system to flow at full capacity. So the maintenance SOP, uh, we identified with the different levels of priority, different numbers of work orders associated with these. So the elevated, the highest priority, there are 154 work orders. The next level would be 362. And then the third level of priority would be 885. There's a couple other work orders that are associated with structures that could not be evaluated fully either because the, the, the lids or the structures were unable to be open to view, or they're just so clogged with sediment that couldn't ha have a full evaluation. So as the crews are able to work through those, they'll be able to continue to address these. So the route for the, the proposed maintenance is to go, is to follow the city's infrastructure zone map because it's already well established. And because there's 12 zones, we'll rotate 
through one zone per month. And then if a particular zone is done, completed with that level of priority, it'll just be skipped over on the next cycle until the entire city is completed with the highest priority, and then we'll shift down to the next quarter. Also identified extent of service, and as I mentioned, we'll continue to address the total complaints as they are received. Those will be more of the higher, highest priority ones. And in, in evaluating the, the city's uh, current uh, work program, for about 18 months of work orders, uh, the city has improved drastically with its response to these complaints. Uh, initially, it was about the median response time was about two months. <coughs> since then, it's been about cut down to about eight days or a little over a week. So there's been drastic improvement since uh, the city's been able to focus on more on the stormwater issues. You might have asked you a question about the work order. Sure. Uh, 154 or 382. That's a lot of work orders. How, how do you determine the impact? In other words, you know, one pipe could affect two houses, one pipe could affect the entire neighborhood. How do you, how do you differentiate, how do you prioritize even that? Those ones will just be so working to address the, job. or it's somewhat, but it'll be focusing on like the highest priority <clears throat> issues first, so that's why we identified that specific issue with sediment being mostly clogged, so a condition where it's 76 to 100 percent, you're restricting flow capacity by more than 80 percent, so. Sure. So those ones would be the first ones to address. Yeah, just to add up. Uh, 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 for right now, I mean, we're not we're looking at the, the actual overall, I mean, uh, overall uh, impact on individual properties. It's more of the system as a whole. And when we get through the whole system, I mean, we're actually opening up, uh, making it run more efficient. And from that, we feel that the uh, city as a whole will, will be impacted. Now, we might can come up with specific areas where we can actually say, okay, well, this box is uh, affecting this property here. But, uh, just from this data, unless we have uh, more detail, like you give me an address of that box, we probably can come up with how it, how is, uh, the, um, the maintenance problem is going to impact that property as, as for the better. But uh, overall, this is more like just the whole city of the home. So, I mean, did I hear you say that you're going to divide it up into 12 zones and go zone by zone until those 154 work orders across those 12 zones are done? That's right. Well, we're going to do that. That's going to be the, the wrap for now. Okay. What we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll prioritize the, the, the high priority. <coughs> Once we get done with that throughout the city, we'll jump down to the next priority and so forth so on. But you'll be going through, you'll work zone through zone on a high priority, and then you go zone through zone on a lesser priority. That's right. We're, That's what your game plan is. That's right. And what we're trying to do is uh, get to these, these uh, uh, issues before we get uh, phone call complaints. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to cut down the phone, phone call complaints and actually go out there and, and, and kind of uh, repair and relieve all these issues before they become issues. Now, once we get through all these work orders, uh, I imagine that we're, we're going to we're gonna go back and um, reevaluate all these. Uh, Structure again and come up with another list like, like this because, uh, as, as we know, you know, maintenance doesn't ever stop, it's a continuous process. And uh, you know, the better, better we stay in front of it, the less issues we have you know, overall. How long do you think it'll take to get through the 154? Uh, I know you're doing a month per zone, that's right. You think uh, it depends on, on the actual work being done. For example, uh, if we have to regrade the ditch, uh, that's probably one of your slower tasks, just because you need a uh, dump truck carrying dirt out. Uh, you need heavy equipment for uh, things like that. Uh, concrete, you need a, a format that is set, so it takes a couple days. Uh, I would think we probably would get maybe, depending on the type of work, on average, maybe seven or eight work orders a week. And uh, that's what we're, we're doing now, so that's where that number's coming from. Okay. I'm definitely glad to hear you say what you said, because District 2 will definitely need a maintenance. So when I get back home, I get that this is a plan in place now. Okay. You know, that's good. That's good. I see the red dots. I'm happy to see that. So Start saying this to be first. Yeah, 
the next portion of the, the maintenance work program is related to the structural issues, <coughs> and that's when we look at capital maintenance that uh, are, are tasks that the city crews do. But with the capital maintenance issues, they require <coughs> additional time to complete than some of the operational maintenance issues, and require some additional financial uh, costs associated with them. So these will take a little bit longer time to complete than the ones such as removing sediment or debris. But we created a separate map and summary table, provided this to the engineering uh, division. And some examples of these are just uh, broken manhole covers or damaged pipe or damaged mortar. Uh, and also we identified a prioritization level for these as well. And simply, or the yellow is the lowest priority, orange is high, or middle, and then the red is the highest. So overall there's about 37 of these maintenance issues across the, across the city, but 99 are the, the lower priority. And then the final aspect of the first task order was dealing with the capital improvement program, uptake and prioritization. Sorry about it flipping so fast. Uh, so the city had an addition or had a, an existing watershed delineation that was based solely on topography, but because we did the drainage assessment in the first task, we were able to add this and then refine the watersheds. to be able to have greater accuracy for determining which areas flow into where. And then we overlaid all the capital improvement projects on top of this layer to help prioritize uh, which basins need the most work or are most urgent. And then one that I'll highlight today is Basin 7, which is named as Martin Luther King West. And it's a 242 acre drainage area. And it's located in the top of the watershed, so there's no other areas that flow into this basin. And the area that flows out at the end will eventually go into Little Lots Creek. This particular basin has six CIP projects, which is the second most. The basin with the largest has seven, and, but it is three times as large, so this has a much higher density of projects. It also has the highest score, summing all the capital improvement project indexes that were calculated for, the, for this project. And then also had two of the top four projects, so it really had the highest level of projects associated with it. And then uh, Wesley Parker is going to highlight uh, capital improvement project number 62, which is Moore Street and Green Street, which is one example. <laughs> That's nice, right. Wesley Parker. We looked at 64 projects and came up with a cost estimate and then ranked the projects. <laughs> To fill your question on did some receive higher higher weighting because of the more damage they could cause? Yes, and these and these six to four projects and they were ranked based on projects they got that were street flooding had higher rankings, projects that were structural that were uh, threatening structures got higher rankings. And, and um, so number sixty two was actually was that's the ID number, but it was it actually ranked number three. So this is the third project. This is over on Moore Street. Um, this particular area is down on the, the side between Green Street and Donny Simmons. Um, the area north of here is, and, and west of here is Julius P. Bryant, old Julius P. Bryant. That entire drainage field, old football field, is draining into an 18 inch pipe that runs through this neighborhood. And the 18 inch pipe can't take, can't take that amount of flow. What happens is it jumps over the street and threatens the house. Um, there that it hasn't gotten into the house, but it's gotten up onto the onto the porch, and um, the the landowner, the, the house owner, was she was out in the in the street, and we talked to her, and she gets worried every time it it rains. So this is a good project. What we're proposing is to take the 18 inch out, replace it with a 30 inch pipe, and then put curbing on along her yard, so if it ever did over top, it would get the curb and run down the street. So. That's just an example of one of the one of the sixty four projects. Did I say that correctly? One at a quarter million dollars, right? One project. One yeah. project, quarter of a million. That was one of the more expensive projects as well. So the So Parker Engineering had worked to develop a probable costs for each of these 64 projects as well as a ranking system or evaluate 
and rank each of the projects to help with prioritizing them. But this provides a summary of the CIP projects. 20 out of the 32 basins contain at least one CIP project. And as you mentioned, there are a total of 64 that have been completed. Uh, there's 59 remaining, and of the 59 remaining, the total cost is six million. As part of this specific task order, we added 12 new CIP projects, and then three of the projects were significantly updated. And then all of the remaining ones, the other 44, were updated for 2017 cost unit, or unit cost in 2017. Uh, the next steps for the stormwater master planning, moving on with the next task order, would be to do hydrologic and hydraulic modeling and master planning for a particular basin. So the approach will need that we need to have survey grade, uh, survey grade inventory data to be able to complete the model, which will require elevation and elevation data so we can compute slopes. Uh, all the drainage inventory that was conducted to date was just map grade, so just identifying the location uh, just on an XY plane, but we'll need to have uh, elevation data as well to develop the hydraulic, hydraulic model. We're, choosing, or it's, we're recommending to focus on the top of the watershed because if you're addressing issues on the top of the watershed, it will help to alleviate some of the issues downstream. And then also if you're working in the top of the watershed and you're developing a model, It'll be a, a smaller area that you'll need to have that detailed survey data for, so it'll help reduce some of the cost for that as well. So highlighting a few of the ones in the top of the watershed that are higher priority are these basin, or one of them is the first basin that I mentioned earlier, basin number seven, MLK West. Uh, the second highest priority based off the CIP projects was basin number two, the uh, Lake Sal area, and then the third priority would be a combination of basins 14 and 8. Uh, there's an existing a detention project going on in 14, but in order to model the flow through 14, we would have to have 8 as well. And that summarizes uh, <clears throat> the approach for the, the next portion of the stormwater master planning. Do you have any additional questions for, for those portions? Your priority list, as you've you been completed, then it moves from red to mm -hmm. you know, gray or where we go. Orange. Well, I assume if you the solve it, you could go from red to gray. You could go from 100% block to 0% block. It would be solved. Yeah, we'll go so it, it, are these reports, it, this is not a static report, this is a live <coughs> report. Yet. So in other words, at the end of the week, you can run the report and go, hey, we solved these five problems. Here are the next, here's yeah. what's in the red zone now. It's all, it'll all be within the GIS database, so anytime that you update a particular point or feature, uh -huh. it'll show that uh, the so all these maps are, 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 are ongoing, in other words, so in, in a month from now, if they solve some things, you can hit a button and pop the up the map, and those, some of those red dots go away, and other red dots pop up. It will change that way, but it won't, uh, I don't think we have it set up that it'll change the maps director right away from the red to the greens. It'll, yeah. it'll change it within the GIS database, and then when they create a new map based off of that, that updated information, then it will technically change from red to green, but it will, the map itself won't change until they update the GIS database. I think what Phil is asking, Marcos, is that as these projects get done, is there a way that we can see that so we can share that with the constituents in the districts that things are working here? Yeah, well, so that, not just that, but I mean to see, all right, mm -hmm. now you've taken these five things off, now run another report down here in the next, you know. Right, but you, you can, you can put a schedule. I mean, I'm assuming yeah. you're going to have a schedule of what, of what you intend to do. That's right. Uh, what we're doing now is we use uh, uh, HyperWeb to do a workforce system, you know, keep a record, and also uh, uh, we're working with Justin to keep the maps updated. So uh, as we progress, you know, and, and I come back or council mayor to you know, give updates, we can show that data as far as how many of those red dots we've done so far. Uh, we can give you numbers, location, we can put the maps up. Okay. Uh, I guess what I'm asking is more along the lines, is it a rolling inventory or is it a static inventory? Every time you change something, does that change it in the database and then you can run a report that it shows that? Or do you have to go through every year and go through and, you know, kind of like, it's the difference between using a, a gun at Walmart or using a paper inventory 
in your in your slide. Well, we want it to be as, as, uh, as fluid as possible. Uh, as we we uh, complete some of these uh, in, this, uh, these problems, we want to go ahead and update the, the database, and that will give you an updated okay. uh, uh, map or, or you know information as far as what we've done. Uh, but it'll be a it'll be a system that we have in place. It's not going to be that. Uh, Quick, I would say. Okay. It just depends on, on, on the crew actually, you know, put it in there, put it in the data, say, okay, we've done, uh, you know, zone four, uh, box 10, we, we cleaned it. So that one's green now. Right. So, you know, it just depends. And, and, and like I said before, uh, uh, in the future, I'll come back and, and we'll, we'll show the progress as far as how we move through the city and all the actual, uh, I mean, red dots that we covered. During that time period. The other question I had, you said you had that app. If, if guys are out in the field and they happen to see something, and the, the you know it's changed from 25 percent block to 75 percent block, are they able to do that live right there? Yes, that has to go. Like, ooh, look at that. Mm -hmm. That storm drain wasn't like that when they came through two weeks ago. What happened? You know? Yeah, that's the goal. The goal is, is that you continually update the maps as far as uh, looking for other issues that that, uh, that weren't there at the time we we done this uh, survey. Because uh, uh, you know, maintenance is going to be a, a, a long term. It never ends. So we're eventually, if we don't, we don't uh, keep it up, we'll get back to this point again. In other words, uh, so we got to keep keep on top of it. To, uh, look for uh, other issues that, that arise over time. But yeah, it's going to be more of a, 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 a I guess a fluid map. It's always going to be changing. It's right. going to stay like this forever. Yeah. I got a question. It's not for y'all particularly. Um, based on what I saw, it's about $7 million for the projects that you listed, $6 million yeah. plus, right? Okay. Are we building, A, can we build any of that into T-SPLOS? Because some of it does go along the roadway. I know that y'all are working on T-SPLOS projects, but $7 million for the projects in our stormwater utility, that would take a very long time. Considering part of the stormwater utility is used for just regular maintenance and not these infrastructure project, so has any thought been given on filling any of this into the system? Yeah, I think the, the storm drain is affecting the road. And if it's at a road to the west, that certainly is transportation technology. That's right, but we are, we're in the process of coming up with that list because that has to be done fairly quickly, so to get it on the ballot, et cetera, et cetera. Are we doing that, Randy? Are we building a list of these projects? So does any of it have this in it? Where it's, where it's appropriate and it's, a, and it's a part of the street improvement that we would need to do. I mean, the reason I say that is because when we're talking about t it would be nice for folks to know of the $7 million that we need in improvement projects for drainage in the city, t Sploss will, you know, be covering a million of that or two million or whatever. So, and as we, are we plan on building any of this in a Sploss? We got them ready. Okay. I mean, to me, it just seems like there may be an opportunity there to, for some of these blocks to go towards this, and so we don't have to wait yeah. 12 years to finish these blocks. We're trying to pull them out of squats. We're going to need a stormwater utility on these blocks. Okay. It's transportation over Okay. That was it. That's all I had. Any other questions? Uh, just wanted to uh, uh, reiterate that uh, this, this information right here is going to help us a lot. Uh, as, as you know, uh, in the past, the city uh, has uh, been more reactive, more of a complaint, uh, you know, a phone call complaint driven. I'm hoping that, that with this information, we can go ahead and, and uh, go over here and start being proactive and, and actually address some of the issues before uh, we need phone call complaints. And, uh, and at the end, you know, make sure that the system itself functions efficiently, uh, so that uh, when we have some of these storms like the hurricanes and all, we will see minimal uh, flood issues. And that's the main goal. Well, also, the CIP chemicals are being in front of us, so that we can plan how to kind of go about uh, funding some of these projects. It gives us a little more uh, information, and it can give us more direction. I think overall, the uh, the master plan is going to help us a lot as far as one more and uh, like gives direction for us. Gives direction also gives us, give us a, a way to uh, audit ourselves to see what kind of problems we're doing. Uh, we make an impact, uh, where can we change to make a bigger impact. So I think overall we'll, we'll have a good, good uh, system with the master plan in place. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, they were just going to pull up a map, um, but while we're doing that, the uh, building at 125 South College Street, uh, which is located at the intersection of Frazier Street and South College Street, uh, once housed the administrative office for the municipal court. Uh, it's been vacant since March of 2016 when the offices were moved over to the old police department building. Uh, the building is a 1,700 square foot uh, wooden frame building, and we would like to get it removed because of a uh, intersection improvement project that we have in our CIP to improve the uh, the West Grady Street at South College intersection. Any of you that have driven through there, I know you know that it's impossible to make a right turn without jumping the curb or going in the opposing lane. Um, so that's the primary reason that the, the building is sitting so close to the road that it actually interferes with uh, the improvements that we'd like to make. We're actually working on the design, and the design pretty much goes through the front porch of the building, pretty much. So, um, we've already removed all the asbestos containing materials from the building. Um, and as you probably see on the screen, this is the, uh, the arrow run. Yeah, there we go. Just make sure everybody knows we're talking about the, the old building that uh, is kind of directly across the street from the old police department. So, um, once the building is gone, obviously we can make the uh, the uh, intersection improvements, and we would also be able to add some extra parking in that area. The parking lot for the existing municipal court fills up pretty quickly, and this would be like some, some spillover parking. And uh, also the police department, the new police department, will be able to use it as additional parking as well. Uh, if the surplus and disposal is approved by council, our plan would be to run uh, public advertisements. In case someone wanted to uh, place bids on the building to be able to move it to another location, or if they wanted to salvage the lumber out of it, for example, there would be a couple of options. Or if no one's interested in it, we'll just, we can just actually demo the building and have it remove ourselves to see if you could as well as another option. So uh, we haven't ironed all that out yet, but that would be we'll, we'll make public effort. We'll, do run public advertisements before we make that decision. So, um, if anyone has any questions, let me know. Is the only improvement on that intersection going to be where you run it through the house once it's gone? No, ma'am. No, it's uh, we're going to improve all four corners of that intersection. So, through the radiology corner. What's it going to do to the house directly down mm -hmm. across because it's very close? <coughs> yes, sir. No. Right. We have already acquired right away that we need on, we on that corner as well. And uh, we're not going to have to relocate anything. It's not going to impact the house, but we are going to improve the radius on. The design is not totally complete yet, but I don't think we're going to impact the house at all. So. What would you be proposing to begin work on this? Uh, no date yet, we're still working on the design, and this was one thing we had to work through as part of that. I don't think it will take us, the design's already, been, already started, so I don't think it's going to take us a terribly long time to complete that, so I would think it would be relatively soon. Any further questions for her? Any comments? Well, comment. I'd like to hear that people open to both of the buildings to the public and now guys and give the public a chance to opportunity to buy the building or dispose of it as opposed to the city having to do it. And we don't know if anybody would be interested, but you never know. We'll, we'll find out. Yes, sir. We're going to put it on the curb and see if somebody takes it up. <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out what straight they're going to haul it down. <laughs> Do I have a motion for the surplus and disposal of the building located at 125 South College Street? Do you have a second? Great. Any discussion? All in favor, please say by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries.
Tell us about a ten out of nine. Tell us about the Georgia Relief. Very cute play on words with that. Relief program grant. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Robert Seamus, here's the parts of Martinda. Also with me, Wesley Parker, your Tree Board Chairman. Uh, this morning, we're bringing before you the application uh, or, or requesting permission to submit the application as required by the city's grant policy. Uh, as you know, uh, back there at Hurricane Matthew, the city did sustain some tree loss, uh, various parks, cemeteries, uh, the cemetery, uh, city facilities, and uh, along the walking trails. And uh, basically, by applying for this grant, we would like to see some $5,000 that is out there that does not require matching funds. If uh, we can get this grant, we estimate it should be able to replace between 20 and 30 trees. The grant itself uh, will pay for trees, staking materials, gator bags, and possibly installation if needed. Um, it also uh, can only be used on city property. You cannot go on private property. So at this time, uh, the tree board myself would like to request to be allowed to uh, submit for this grant. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Stingley? No questions. I don't have a comment for the city. You seem to be an extra good, do just a job of a constant getting these grants, and that's a good thing for the city and the representation of yourself. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Decision by council was not the appropriate decision. Um, 
during your presentation, I'm going to ask about why you're appealing. I'm going to ask counsel to hold off questions until you're done. And then once you're done with your individual presentation, counsel is more than welcome to answer, ask any questions of the presenter. Once that is done, we'll go to the next person. Let's go and present. And then once we're through, the two folks that are appealing, the two firms that are appealing, we'll allow Shell Hankins at that time to respond to the concerns of the appeals. At that point, counsel will begin their discussion. And if counsel, someone from counsel motions to rescind the vote, then that will be addressed at that time. I would ask, because I've noticed, I think I know pretty much everybody from who's here, that if you're going to come up and speak on behalf of your appeal, let's limit it to two people at the microphone. I know some of y'all might want people from your firm, but I think two is a legitimate number to start with. Did anybody have before we get started? Everybody good? All right. Mr. Blackmore, go ahead and present your background. I'm going to be about in two minutes. Okay. We sent out a request for a proposal earlier this fall. We received four proposals. Of those four, we narrowed it down to three, which were Shaw Hankins, Capstone, and Fred Davis. This phase was based on services that they could provide, such as experience, software platforms, things of that nature. They were ranked by the committee in the order that I just mentioned. At that time, there was no mention of any savings by any of the firms in their submittals. An additional step that we did this time was to allow for the finalists to come forward and present to the committee stuff that they didn't have enough room to write down in their submittals, provide some clarification of their ideas, and just allow the firms the opportunity to tell us more about what it is that they can do. After the interview stage, the rankings remained the same. Only at that time, we had a firm that was willing to tell us the amount of money that they believed that they could save the city, the taxpayers, as well as the employees. And those were the basis of our recommendation to the city council a couple weeks ago. Since that last meeting, I've had a number of comments relating to a comment that was made by Shaw Hankins during their presentation about that the present discount is 30% when there are documents that report that the city's discount is 49 plus percent, 49.5 or 6%. But as we were told during the interview process by two of the firms, and I've spoken to two other brokers that have stated that it isn't only about the discount percentage. It's about the price that the network provider negotiates with the provider that the discount is based on. So the discount is a factor, but it isn't the only factor. I go back to the beginning of the process when we were looking for a firm that could provide our employees with the best overall program of services that would help us and also help us become more efficient and therefore hopefully reduce our cost. After the submittals and the interviews, it became apparent that we had a firm that met our needs in providing a higher level of service for our employees and a willingness to save in dollars and not just a discount percentage of what it is we could save. Those savings have the ability to lower the cost to our employees and our expenses for our health care costs. It also appears that this proposal from Shaw Hankins gives us the best chance to get some control over our expenses that seem to grow yearly. We realize that there are some upfront costs with this proposal, but as council may remember during the budget this past year, we raised the cost to employees by $20 per month because our costs were going up. We believe that the services provided by Shaw Hankins are comprehensive and they are the services and they are services that they have now in place. So in addition to the savings that were told us, it seemed appropriate for us to bring that recommendation to council at the last meeting. And just a final point of the way that staff looks at their responsibility is to bring the best proposal that we believe benefits the employees and the taxpayers. So that was our bottom line and that's what we brought forward based on the information that we have. All right, at this point, I'm going to call up the firms in the order of which their appeals were sent in. Glenn Davis sent in theirs first. Brian Glenn, president, submitted that. So I'm going to ask Glenn Davis to come forward first. Please make 
sure you all can use yourselves. That would be great. Is there one? Associates and I with me, John Taylor from Taylor Benefit Resources. Uh, as you know, we've had the insurance for the past almost 10 years. And it gives me no, no pleasure at all to stand up here and feel this. Um, but I feel right, right, and wrong is wrong. So, uh, based on the, as Randy said a minute ago, based on the discounts that were uh, set in the last city council meeting, we're feeling this. Um, if you look at the past three years, and these are numbers that we uh, that we give to everyone at every uh, quarterly meeting when we have those meetings. This is part of the this is part of what we discuss. And for the past ten years, we've gotten anywhere between a forty-eight to fifty percent discount using the industry buying group. So, as Randy alluded to, um, at the last city council meeting on September nineteenth, Mr. Shaw stood up here and said that three times that the current uh, network is a 30% discount when in fact we get a 50. So again, this is the uh, information that we give quarterly. So I think the staff, everybody on the staff knows that we're getting close to a 50% discount. So if we can go to the next slide, we've got the actual numbers. <coughs> is a 49.5 and those are actual retail those are the retail charges at almost six and a half million dollars and then it shows the 3.2 million dollars which is the actual PPO discount so we're running close enough to 50 percent I believe okay if you look at uh, 2016 same thing applies 47.9 and if you look at the prior year to that we're running about 49.2 percent discount um, having said that, I feel uh, strongly that the decision that the City Council made uh, was based on grossly misrepresented numbers, and I would ask that you reconsider. Okay. And I'm going to let John give a few comments if it's okay with the Mayor and Council. Yeah. Absolutely. Just introduce yourself. I'm John Taylor, President of Taylor Benefit Resource. And, um, I was shown uh, this part of the presentation that was given um, from Shaw Hankins and didn't really understand and was trying to go through um, where they were getting their numbers, how did they get these numbers. The, um, the, the $2.95 million, um, from what it looks like they're expressing in that is that is bill charges minus your PPO discount. Um, that's not correct. It, it, I'm not sure what their source is for that. Uh, that is actually, for medical claims, the actual paid out amount. Uh, what you have is a situation where you have allowables um, after bill charges, which is you know, taking out your PPO discounts, but then you also have, after that, then you have your deductibles, co-insurance, your co-pays and things like that that come out of it. So that 2.95 is actually the final amount, not your amount after discounts. Um, that may or may not seem important, but there is a, a pretty large distinction. Um, however, um, when we're, we're talking about um, some other incorrect assumptions there, they're saying that they're, they're going to get 50% discounts off of what they're saying our um, bill charges were. So if you compute these numbers, if you take their 1.9 and you multiply it by 2 because they're saying they're going to get 50% discounts, that gives you uh, 3 million and change as your bill charges. And as we saw just a second ago, 
um, that's grossly underneath what our actual bill charges were for the time period. Um, but furthermore, what has been stated by Sean Hankins is that um, that IBG has only been able to get a 30% discount. That representation actually shows only getting a 23% discount. So, so the numbers on this uh, table uh, actually even doesn't agree with some of the things that were stated in their presentation verbally. Um, the difference between 23% and 30%. So there's a, a pretty significant difference there as well. And so, uh, again, I just wanted to, to point these differences out and, and disagreements in their, um, their, their presentation tools and their discussion. Um, one last thing that I wanted to point out from some of the things Mr. Webmore was saying a second ago about um, different carriers and such being able to negotiate different bill charges amounts. And that I don't believe is accurate, sir. Um, basically, providers have to bill everybody the same. It doesn't matter if you have Medicare, if you've got a self-funded health plan, if you've got a fully insured plan. They all, everyone has to be billed the same. There would be gross um, discrimination issues if a provider did not do that. The power that different carriers or PPO networks has with their discounting after the claim is billed. So everybody gets billed the same thing. It's then a matter of what network do you use to get discounts off of those bill charges. So everybody gets billed the same. And um, you know we've talked about it every quarter for every year, how crazy the city has been able to have 50, you know, around 45 to 50% discounts since we've taken over you know, for the last 10 years. And um, you know, the IBG network has been very, very good. And, uh, and useful for the city. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I have one more comment to make you. I may. the uh, city council meeting on September 19th. I watched it on YouTube three times. And there were some things that were alleged that we were not being aggressive on. One of them was the prescription drug card. And I assure you that we, in every quarterly meeting, we sit down and we talk about what we can do on prescription drugs. This is a email that was sent to the city on September 7th that represents a $140,000 uh, reduction in drug costs just by changing three prescription medications. And I know we've only got the insurance for one more quarter, unless this is overturned. But if we went ahead and got to go ahead on this right now, that's a $35,000 savings to the city between now and the end of the year. And as far as our service goes, uh, I got a phone call from the people who made the decision to go with, uh, to go with uh, Shaw Hankins. And quote unquote, they said that Glenn Davidson Associates gives them nothing but five star service. So I think that says a lot about us right there. Any questions? Thank you for your time. Jeff, did you want to speak to that email directly? Um, how many pages do you have in that email? Five. Ah, okay. You know, the landscape of, of health insurance has changed greatly. And uh, we know that through ACA, Affordable Care Act, and all those different things. And 
We have a very sophisticated and complex plan. We've got a health and wellness center, we've got a fitness center, we've got fitness coaches, partnering with Georgia Southern, um, just a lot of different things. We've got a tobacco free program, um, we've got a health risk assessment, and we've got a lot of different things going on with, with our participants and with our employees. So, one of the things we do is every quarter um, uh, we need to talk about the health plan and how it's performing. And we actually um, we actually uh, invite our employees to that meeting. Um, and this email that you have, I'll start from the beginning, it actually started back in July. And it ended in September, as you can see. Um, and I'll say this, I, I do think it's unfortunate that I have to be up here and explain this, but, that, but, but I'll, I'll have to. I started this email thread. Okay? Um, and I'll read where I started it. It was a follow-up to our meeting that we had that week. I actually sent it about three or four days later because to hold them accountable to make sure it happened. Okay. So, as you can see, I'll read it real quick. My email said, John, as discussed at the last part of the meeting, please provide, one, recommendations for cutting generic costs for maintenance drugs. Provide a percentage and dollar amount that you believe we can cut based on the data you have. Two, a definition for the following drugs used on a plan. A clear explanation of what they're used for. Does the clinic carry them? If so, for what cost? Shannon, who's with the Health and Wellness Center, the goal was to take the clinic, our Health and Wellness Center, and take our third party administrator and look at the drugs that were being utilized at the clinic and look at the drugs that are being utilized on the plan and try to figure out are there drugs being utilized on the plan that we can offer at the Health and Wellness Center to cut costs, okay? These are things the staff brought to the table, okay? And pushed and pushed through and you'll see through this email. Um, so Shannon can identify once he gets the list, he's from the Health and Wellness Center, and the cost for each. A, top 25 drugs by dollar, B, top drugs per average cost, and top 25 drugs per claim. Um, the purpose is eventually to compile a list of medications used on the plan that are available at the Health and Wellness Center, then send them via mail to participants from Taylor Benefits in the Health and Wellness Center. Please let me know when you can have this by thanks in advance. Um, that was July 17th. Um, the next email I followed up August 31st, and I said, I hope everyone is well. Labor Day weekend is approaching. Can each person provide an update on, on where each person is on this checking in? Okay, it's real important. We have open enrollment coming soon, so it's important we get these strategies out so we can communicate them to our employees, okay? Uh, Shannon Middleton from our Health and Wellness Center responded that Thursday, August 31st, 2017. He said, I've submitted the pharmacy report to John. I anticipate that he is working to review these items for savings and opportunities. Um, the next time I heard, um, didn't hear anything on that day. It wasn't a week later. I heard back from John. Sorry to delay. I was out town several days trying to catch up. Um, uh, I had to catch up on a few things prevented me from following up. There are a couple of things I have found that can have positive returns on the plan. I'll try to have an explanation to you by tomorrow. <coughs> and then September 7th, that is when the strategies that you see came in. Okay. I think what's important to see here is that um, our plan has evolved as healthcare has evolved. And it is important that we have a broker in place that um, has the resources, um, that has the capability, um, that has the consultation ability, the negotiation ability, that has the aggressiveness to push things like this through. Um, now staff, we don't mind working on these things, but it is important and vital that we have a broker in place that's capable of pushing items like this through. So as we look through the the bid process, these were some of the things that we were looking for. Um, and I have a list of other things that I can go through um, in terms of when money was le almost left on the table. I have facts and documentation here where money was almost left on the table, and if it, it was staff 
who stepped in to ensure that money was not left on the table. When it came to stop loss, when it came to uh, our network, I have two emails here from one from 2013 and one in 2016 where we challenged our, our broker and our TPA about our PPO network. We asked them to audit our PPO network and look at it so that we can see if there's any cost savings in there. Because when we see 49%, obviously that, that makes your eyes perk up. And for us, we wanted to make sure it's just a percentage. What's behind the scenes? Are we getting the cost of the we can be getting? So I just wanted to kind of point that out. Yeah, yes, and I understand that, but sure. I'm, I'm looking at the letter from John sure. Taylor. I'm, I'm looking at the, the appeals letters. Sure. And it, it appears that, not that this information may not be valid, I get you. but it's not what the appeal is about. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, absolutely. at this point, we're not really questioning the process. What's, your, what's being questioned absolutely. are the numbers absolutely. that were utilized in this particular draft. Sure. I think both sure. appeals focus solely on this. Um, we're not really talking about the process. What sure. you use, well, I think how you determine. Like, I, think, I think in this is what I'm I, I understand. But, but the appeals are about this, so maybe we need to have this described first. And I understand. I understand, but I think staff wanted to respond to this. Absolutely. I think that's what to do that, and that was brought forth. So, thank you, Jeff. I do want to say at this point that I did say at the beginning of the process that if, if council had any questions, and Brian sat down before I could, we could get to that part, do y'all have any questions about the presentation that Glenn Davis gave that you? Would like to ask them about the materials that they submitted, the presentation they gave, does anybody have a question for them? Well, should I ask Randy one quick question? One, when did the RFQ go out? Approximately. So I'm looking at there, like in August? I have it. Hold on. Okay. And when were the presentations? Final presentation. September 7th. September 7th. Yeah. Okay. So no questions for Glenn Davis. Does anybody have a question uh, in your The only question yeah. I have is, did you present this in your presentation? I believe so, yes. Oh. No, not, did not, not, did not present it. No, not, not during the interview. Yeah, no. If that's what you're talking about. Yeah, no. During their two-hour presentation. No. We received that. Your sales pitch. We received that the day before the before the presentation. I'm sorry, but what are you referring to? Uh, your the the final presentation. It was two hours before staff, correct? Where yeah. each each individual group got to get up and give their sales I, pitch. Your question is it off? Did you include these discounts and this? Okay. No, sir. Okay. Any other questions for Glenn Davis? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Capstone. You have a second to submit your appeal. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Ben Watkins. I'm a principal of the Capstone Benefits Consulting. Come to South Area Statesboro. Um, we don't have any numbers. We don't have any presentations. Uh, I'm going to go my appeal. Because I believe the appeal should be based on what we're asked to submit in the RFQ. In the RFQ, if you look at my appeals as attachment A, it gives the eight, not uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight metrics that we use to um, measure the consulting firm to be chosen for the city. Nowhere in here will you find how much you're going to save us. It does ask what tools will you use to help us save money, which is you'll see in our RFQ in our presentation. And we spent a great deal of time in our two-hour presentation on how to do this. Um, a little background, 
we actually, Leonard and I were actually the architects of IBG. We built them in 1995 at the request of employers here in town who felt like there wasn't a, their care concerns were not being addressed. There were no rural BPOs in the state of Georgia at the time. Uh, back then it was South Care and it was, of course, it was not, Blue Cross wasn't even happening. It was still Blue Cross Blue Shield, not for profit at the time. Um, you had BHCS and South Care, and both of them told us there was no, we were not in the plans for the last half of 94 and the first half of 95. So there was a BPO bill for that. Since that time, we managed and ran the, uh, that BPO <coughs> moved on, and I became the, uh, worked with Memorial Hospital in Savannah, expanded and built their narrow network out in the region. And then uh, Lou and I own our own TPA. I, I share these things with you that um, our experience, which is what we relayed to the staff and what was listed here in the, the criteria, again, doesn't talk about saving money. So our exception is that based on the presentation on the 19th, that the decision was made based on the savings. And I won't debate the numbers, I think they've been discussed, but I also shared with your staff that the real challenge is not going to be the discount. Mr. Webber, where's correct? It's about what you've built. You happen to live in one of the most expensive healthcare cities in the country. Uh, we won't go real deep in that, but um, if you look at the latest CMS report, um, looking at averages, we're hospitals around us, similar hospitals are going to be in that 350 to 400% of Medicare. Uh, the Savannah hospitals are in that 450, sometimes as much as 500. East Georgia's outpatient procedures are 900% of Medicare. If you get 50% off 900%, you still are paying more than you do somewhere else. Those are the kinds of things we shared with your staff. He goes, and then we're talking about technology. Um, as you see in my appeal, uh, on number number two, uh, when I we talked about reference I they just said in the uh, presentation, you know, the references were called in um, the local school system, which they used for the, uh, technology, that good reference. And my wife was a teacher, and I was a, actually a consumer of Shaw Hankton Services. The Brian Kelly was listed and said, we saved them $100,000. I called my references, and according to my references, no one called them to ask about our abilities or our experience. The city of Douglas has been our client since 2005. We listed them primarily because we had to save them money. Their employees still pay $20 a paycheck for health care, okay, and spend less than you do. So uh, our appeal is based on the criteria that were used, or at, we were asked to, and to be judged on. And the last question we asked the staff before we left is please share with us where we were deficient in any of these criteria. We also listed about 15 to 18 items that were in the um, statement of work. We asked them to share with us had we left anything untowards there. Staff replied to us that you would not be here if you had not met these metrics to our satisfaction. So again, my appeal says based on the information that was presented and from almost 50%, at least 50% of the decision was based on the savings. Our appeal is that was actually incorrect. Most of us know that. And then the last comment is bigger is not better. Now, we were chosen to be the consultant for a group uh, a little over a year ago that had Blue Cross, and I'm using Blue Cross, but they, they were referenced primarily, as a um, provider of network and administrative costs. Blue Cross showed them that they, were, they enjoyed about a 3.8% differential nationally, that's across the whole country, over the other rental networks you might own, United Signet. But when we did an analysis, um, one of the major rental networks was actually better in the markets they were in, and it saved them $150,000 in administrative cost. You currently pay, I know this from the opinion, you currently pay 11 bucks for admin costs and a couple bucks for uh, pre certain other services. I, I, you know, I've known the Taylor Benefits folks a long time, they do a good job. But you get what you pay for. If you want technology and other things, and staff made that clear, it costs more than what you're currently paying. So to get the acumen and to get the technology you want, it will cost more. But again, we'll go back to my, my point is I, my appeal is asking you to actually disqualify Shell Happens because I, I think they indicated by their numbers that they don't have the acumen. And of the uh, one question that was not answered was how many, and um, they're here today, you, you hate to ask a question you know the answer to, but I have some knowledge about it. 
how many of their myriad of clients they share with your actual healthcare clients? Uh, yeah, um, so what is the experience? That's all that we do. Well, we have the technology to do enrollment and you know, on, make things simpler. Staff is very clear about that. They were concerned about your employees. Mm -hmm. I feel like we addressed that very well. We have it in-house. I think we noted the technology. Um, Larry, my partner, and whatnot, saw this coming. We partnered with a young man here in town to create Capstone Technology Solutions because we knew we needed technology. So while they do other things, like for you as a, at the police department website, they serve as our technology backroom and manage many of our challenges. We have a client that we just wanted to get, they wanted to get things out of their home system into their payroll system. The two didn't speak. We used our technology team to create and write report that manages and puts all that together based on one page report for employees. We, we met all those criteria. And I said, again, the, the challenge here is nowhere was savings a piece of this and, and the chair with uh, I want to be very careful. Sure, we had a call Mr. Wetmore before we went on with this, and I just took exception to the fact that about the savings piece because we were not asked to provide savings numbers. We were asked to explain how we would work with the city to save money, and that's where our references come in to validate what we showed them how to save. Um, both Shaw Hankins and, um, and, and Mr. Grant's very correct. There are a lot of things to be done. Drugs is a huge issue, um, a number one issue. Our last point to the staff was, if we're chosen, the very first thing we'll do is do the dive into your data, both historical and, and real time, and provide you with solutions to the actual problems you face. The solution is not to just pick a carrier out of the hat that says we have a deeper discount. Nobody gets fired for hiring Blue Cross. Okay, it, it's to move, to push the envelope and do things differently is what Cash is based on. That's what we've always done. We actually own a narrow network now that we were asked to build for some providers and employers in Douglas and Effingham County and Appling County. Uh, Appling Hospital, which was a former Shell Hackness client, is our client. We were brought in to replace them in the first year. We were hired on May 1st. Said the one was a renewal date. Their stop loss number went from 1.7 million to 1.4 million based on our knowledge of local narrow networks. Not moving to a major network by doing a direct contract with a local hospital and then moving to Chatham County for a better price. We have the acumen, we demonstrated the acumen. But the biggest challenge again is we were not asked to present a savings proposal in real number. We were asked to present how we would. So with that I'll thank you and answer any questions. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask Mr. Watkins? How does it feel? Comments? I'm Scott Hankins with Shaw Hankins, the president of Shaw Hankins. Is there any way we can get that slide back up? There seems to be a lot of focus on that slide. For your knowledge, that slide was one of 35 slides that day. So there seems to be a lot of focus on it. You don't have it over there? Well, if you remember the slide, you have a copy in front of you. I think. He's bringing it right up. Oh. This is what you're referring to? Yes. <laughs> to clear that up, you know, we were here to talk about technology, wellness, service, call center, a variety of things that we do for our clients. And we took the initiative, yes, we were not provided any claims information. We took the initiative to go on your website and look at your budget and look at the medical claims that are listed there in your budget. Then we applied what we felt like were reasonable uh, discounts based on a lot of experience doing this. And that's where we got this chart. So this was not something that we were doing. Um, no, no one gave us the claims information. This is something we did on our own initiative to demonstrate what we can do. We have multiple clients that we've done this for. Um, some of them were listed in our RFP response, like City of Albany. Uh, we projected for them that we could save them about 1.2 million when we took over. It ended up being about two million dollars. Um, very satisfied with our service last year. After nine years, last uh, week they renewed our contract for five more years. Uh, Glenn County Government, we took over in 2011. A little bit different in that we weren't moving them from a local network 
to a carrier network work like we did at the city of Albany. We were going from one carrier to another carrier. We predicted one point of uh, one million dollars in savings, and we achieved that number almost exactly. So we have a lot of experience doing this, and that uh, was fun. I have a lot of notes to respond to, but. Um, we have about 250 clients. There are only 20 that are non-medical. They're school systems like your local school system. Uh, are, are a, big, a big block of our business in terms of bodies, uh, but not, not in terms of uh, actual uh, clients. So this is something we have a great deal of experience doing. Now, let's talk about what's happened since then. We asked for the data from the TBA. We received it about 5 o'clock Friday. 4.30, Okay. So, you know, we've had one business day to look at it. In that one business day, we still feel very comfortable with a number of upwards of a million dollars, not just from the network change, but from prescription drug change also. So, and, and, and frankly, now, what we do is claims repricing. You're talking about a very complex process. Every time you go to the doctor, you know, you get that little yellow sheet and there's all those numbers on there for all those different procedures. You might go to the doctor one time and there's five or six procedure codes that are associated with that. You can imagine if you go in for a significant uh, surgery or something, how many different codes. So that data file had thousands of uh, pieces of information on it. You know, um, analyzing that, comparing it to different networks is a very complex process. And so, um, but in that one day, just looking at it on a cursory level, we've confirmed that his numbers are, we feel like with one day's worth of work, his numbers are very close. But we also feel like the numbers that we've given you are very close too. So we still are very comfortable with that number. And, and ultimately, I guess three, four weeks, we'll come back and show you our analysis. Carriers provide us with information. We use outside actuarial firms to confirm the information. These are firms that uh, are well known and uh, certify their certify their results. And so, there's no opportunity for uh, anything coming to you that's not completely accurate. And so we feel very comfortable that our projected savings will, will, will pan out. And that doesn't even touch PBM. That's a whole, uh, well, pharmacy, that's a whole other thing where we feel like we've been extremely successful in bringing down costs. And um, I, I think we'll only add to those savings. Um, but I think that what we were chosen for was not just that consultative ability, but also our technology. We have we've been doing this for 52 uh, we've had 52 clients that we brought on for over, over the last 10 years, something like 40,000 employees that we do. Wellness programs. We have five clients with on-site health clinics, and that's a lot for one broker. Uh, so there's a laundry list of things I think we were selected for. This one slide seems to have caused a lot of consternation, but we're going to be coming back in about three or four weeks and showing you this analysis. Then as we go into next year, we're going to see the actual results. And I have no reason to believe they're not going to be extremely close to what we projected. I'm trying to think if there's anything else uh, that I didn't touch on, but I'd be glad that. Well, just one more thing. We work with 58 public entities. In Georgia, that's a very small network of people. These HR and finance people from cities and county governments and school systems get together in these associations on a regular basis. If we were uh, in the business of making incorrect assumptions, you'd know about it. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Uh, one. Sure. <clears throat> so for fiscal year 16, Slide numbers our report. It said total charges, just medical, not prescription drug. Total medical was five million seven twenty-three. And according to what according to what's on this chart, um, that would be a, about a seventy percent discount to go from five million seven twenty-three to a million eight eight five. Okay, is the five million bill charges? 
That is what it says here. That is charges on the far left-hand side of the, of the form. It says charges and eligible PPO discount. It goes on. So total paid claims was two and a half million out of a bill of five point seven two three. Here, this is you want it. So if it's yeah, take take that because I, I want to make sure we're clear on something. Which page are you looking at? Uh, this is the Seven analysis for 16. <coughs> 7, 7, 16 to 617? Uh, uh, so fiscal year ending 616. Uh, so we go 715 to 616. Yeah, that's So I mean, I, and like I said, I, I'm, I'm unclear, so I want you to clarify. So if we're if we're reading this right, or if I'm not, please correct me. Uh, that's a 70% discount. Where do, where do you get a 70% discount from? Okay, well, I'm not sure. Are you familiar with this form? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so sticking directly to this again, at that point in time, all we had access to was the amount that was budgeted. So that was a clear line item in your budget for fiscal year 2016. Of 2,900 or 2.9 million for medical points. Right. That's all we did. That's all we had. No, no, nothing. And, and I'm not. I, you know, don't don't take that the wrong way. I'm just saying uh, what's budgeted and what's actually billed and paid is two different things in most cases. And I get where you're going. I just uh, I think the biggest issue that I know I've had is uh, in the past, and, and obviously this is not a reflection of this this event, but I think there's a lot of Maybe John will share this with me because I think he, he and I experienced it the most. We've had a lot of history with uh, not getting accurate information and being asked to make decisions, and I think he and I are both pretty gun-shy when it comes to this. Uh, but that's I go back to it. That's basically about a 70% discount. So even if what you're saying, if you take it down from what's budgeted to what's actually billed, you're still in the 60 to 70 range. So... What am I missing? Because I talked to, you know, Mr. Hankins called me, you know, Brian called me, uh, John Taylor. I, I don't, maybe I'm missing something. Why, why is it that IBG is only getting 50 when this is saying if we go with, uh, you know, a big, big fish in a big pond, we can go from a 50 to a 60 to a 70? Because that's a lot of money. I mean, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. What am I missing? Um. That illustration there is simply the spread, you know, based on the information, <laughs> what we would expect to achieve and what we would expect to be able to illustrate through the repricing analysis that we would love to conduct. Until then, I don't know that you can objectively see and realize the amount of money that we are talking about. But to back up my present CEO, we believe and stand, uh, stand behind our projections. And the city will see those savings in real dollars. Well, yes. Yeah, we're, these two things, never the two shall meet. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're two. No. We, no, didn't have the we didn't have the. No, I know, I know, but this is what I, I want to ask you real quickly. You said you got claims information at 5, 4.45 on Friday. Mm -hmm. Was it for this past year? Did you look at the one that was for, um, let's see, what's this one of those? The 716 through 632,017. Did you guys get that information? Is that what you were I actually haven't been back in the office yet, but I'm sure. The claims detail for the entire full year of this year. Full uh, year, what? Are we talking about our fiscal year or just calendar year 2017? Yeah, essentially the last 24 months in claims, give or take. Claims detail. Mm -hmm. So, did they get this? Um, I don't know that they have that particular report, but those numbers, if, if you take what was sent to them in plain detail, um, it, you can drop them into columns, total them at the bottom, it's the same thing, but I mean, that wasn't requested or it would have been sent to them. Because what this says is total amount of claims, total amount paid. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to say that what they're saying is accurate or inaccurate if you don't look at this to see what was total amount Claim and then total amount paid. How do you know what you can do with this compared to what was paid if this didn't go out? Well, we're dealing with every single claim. In other right. words, when we come back, we'll total up for the periods that we look at. Let me every show you this since you haven't seen this. Okay. 
Because we're talking apples, oranges, and apples right now. All right. Toad charges. Apparently, this is the Tell me, are you talking about more money off of that than what was gotten by this? Does yes, that make sense? Yes, you see what I'm asking? So you're asking essentially at this, um, the 6.4 million plus <coughs> in charges got you down to 3.2 million right. in charges. Yeah, we're saying we can expect to see a drastic reduction to that number. That's what I'm asking. So you're saying that based on that, Charge now six point what's it say? Six and a half. But we actually paid in three point two. You're going you would have gotten a lesser pay in on that amount. That's what I'm asking. Correct. Significant. Which is no, what we're doing again? Just to be clear, darling, which one are you claiming you all dropped so much to do? The EPO discount. The, I guess they're both highlighted in yellow here. Yes. So the number under PPO discount there highlighted in yellow would be the number that would be less and significantly less and very easily illustrated. Should the number be more? Step. Should the discount be more and the total paid be less? Yes, so the discount, the total paid would be less. That's yes, what sir. I'm trying to get Because those are real numbers. That's what we dealt with. That's right. the real number and that's what is very easy for us to illustrate. Again, as Scott said, through an independent third party actuary. Um, and again, it's going to be you know, very objective at that point in time for you to see, you know, exactly what we're saying um, and be able to make your determination there. And the, the question on transparency, we're going to come back with a, a huge report with very detailed information on there on how we got our numbers. <coughs> I didn't ask anything about transparency. I just, I just asked plain and simple. You know, I, I'm, I'm a simple person. I'm, I'm sometimes slow to, to catch stuff. So correct me if I'm wrong, we're still talking about the same thing. The issue that I've got is it's not against you guys. It's the fact that a, a conversation from this council, the first time we've ever heard about it, we made a decision on information that is now being contested and is now being said by the people who presented that it may not come to fruition. It may, but it may not. So we're now off of what the RFQ was originally about. I don't feel comfortable that had this been the conversation last time that we would have either A, made the decision or not said, hey, we need more information, we can't make it at this time. So that's that's the issue I have. But I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I, I don't mean to, I didn't mean to say that they were, we may or may not achieve those numbers. I, without doing that, I swear well, well, I think and, and exactly. it goes back to my original comment was, you know, one of the, one of the biggest issues I had about the last, uh, the last meeting was our fixed costs are going up, which we know that to a certainty, but our variable costs are impossible to predict because you were basing it off numbers that weren't exactly accurate. You're basing it off of budgeted numbers, not actual paid numbers. So the whole the whole thing was flawed. It, I mean, you you can't it, you can't make the decision off of information that is inaccurate to I mean incorrect and inaccurate at best. So my opinion is I don't know how we proceed going in this direction. Now I, I, I'm only one councilman, so I'll let the rest of the council speak. To me, the decision was based on 35 slides of information. This is just not our decision, and our decision is what counts, not theirs. Um, we're the ones that we're given the information, and basically, we are a part-time body that's given information by full-time staff that we expect to be up-to-date, accurate, and real-time information. And I'm not saying that they didn't, but I, I don't. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of consistency here. And basically what the RFQ was about, which is what the decision was supposed to be made about, we have gotten so far off of it, we can't even call it a tangent anymore. Uh, is, is that accurate? Am I, am I, I over-reading this? I don't think that's fair. I, okay. Not not based based on what again, I, I'm only one. Right. Well, not, not based on what I've heard representatives from the city, whether it be Randy, Jeff, Darren, and the others that spoke. I don't hear that the sole decision was made on that at all. Well. Let me put it this way. The weight of the majority of the decision, in my opinion, now that I may be the only one, was the last meeting, a lot of that conversation, and Phil, uh, not picking on you, but you led a lot of that conversation was about, you pressed Jonathan on the million dollar savings. I did. So, Jeff, my comment was, 
I don't know how we can say that that still carries the same amount of weight knowing that we don't feel that number is accurate. I'm not saying it's incorrect, but it's, it's speculative, maybe optimistic at best. I personally believe that the decision, you said that they, their decision doesn't matter. I believe their decision absolutely matters. We are to judge. Their recommendation Let me finish, please. Let me finish, please. We are to evaluate their decision based on the material they present to us that was presented to them. Right? Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. I heard them say, without going back to the tape, but I heard them say that the decision was made multiple times the same way without the financial information. That the financial information, obviously speculative, no doubt about it, because they can't perform you know, the analysis without the material they can do right after. But I hear the decision was made beforehand. And I think we asked that question numerous times in that meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Some of you have watched it for all the times than I have. That the decision that was made was based on the other things that the matrix that we provided and that the Additional savings would be quote unquote or per se gravy or additional opportunity. And I would like to hear from the Rangers and from that group if I may. No, absolutely. I think that we're yes, absolutely. Okay. As I stated at the beginning of this, is when we looked at the three, we actually ranked them before we had any of the information about any savings. It was based solely on that criteria that then presented. That's that's how they made the cut. That's what they. That's that's how we rank them when they when they came in and they gave their presentation. So you rank them based on their applications, essentially their paper applications. On the, on the, on the first of them. Okay. So the response to the RFQ solely. Well, whatever they were submitted for the for the for the, for the first ranking. Okay. Right. That's what we did. And then we took the additional step, which we didn't have to do, and we could have just made the decision based solely on that ranking without having the entry. But we thought it would be fair to have them come in and explain some of that additional information that's that's always out there that you can't you can't get everything into a submittal. You can't get it in the 50 pages, you can't get it in our how, however many pages. And people always want that opportunity to explain in more detail about their program. So that's what we allowed them to do. We didn't tell them what they had to present. We didn't give them a strict script of what they of, of, of what we wanted. They came in and as Phil says, made their pitch. This was this was their time to tell us about their company in personally and in more detail. It was at that time when Shaw Hankins came in and said, We're pretty sure we can save you a million dollars. That, that didn't change the ranking, it was something else we could bring. And, and what I look back at, and, and I, could, I could see this uh, appeal being completely different if we wouldn't have brought Shaw Hankins first. Because Shaw Hankins probably would have appealed and said, hey council, guess what? We told your staff that not only do we have those services that you all want, but we can also save you a million dollars. At that moment, I don't want to have to answer that question of why I didn't bring that forward. Staff doesn't want to have to answer that question. So we rank them based on the services that they can provide. That was Shaw Hankins, in, in our opinion. This, a lot of this is subjective, and, and, and you've heard that today. It's, it's, it's subjective. In our estimation, based on the information we have, based on the interviews, that's the ranking we came with. Shaw Hankins, Capstone, and Good Davis. That was our ranking. Again, if we would have brought this forward, we'd be having a completely different discussion today. So, it was a recommendation, there was a vote, and now we're to hear have a new appeal. But that's how we got here. Now, I do have a question to you two, because you did suggest that our current provider was only getting a 30% discount. I do, I do ask 
you, should, you can suggest that there's a substantial amount of savings available. But how can you suggest that their savings, or this, excuse me, discount, are only 30% when you don't have that knowledge? I will ask that question. I, I'm not sure exactly what he was referring to. We may deal with the fact that between what they're actually getting and what we project is about a 30% increase. Maybe he misspoke and said we can get it. And so we can get a 30% increase in your discounts. That's all I can say. But, it, but, but it's still the numbers, the dollars have not changed. There are so many numbers and so many percentages in this. But bottom line is dollars, I feel like we can save you upwards to or a million dollars. We're asking for the opportunity to bring forth the objective data for you all to see once and for all the savings that were out there that were, quote, left on the table. In conjunction with that repricing study, we will also be able to provide you with options, not only from the Blue Cross, which everyone seems to use them as the example, but we're going to be looking at all kinds of different carriers, different networks, different strategies. So in conjunction with that objective study that shows, A, what was charged, what you paid, and what other savings were out there that were left on the table, but we're also going to be able to show you proposals with performance guarantees on what we can expect and what we recommend for next year. And, John, with all due respect, I think any of the others that would stand before us again now would present those same type opportunities, but I think we're here to clarify was the process done fairly? Did the city make the right decision, and did we make the right decision based on the information that has been presented? With all due respect, because I'm sure we could ask each and every one of you to come up here multiple times throughout the day and hear continually additional efforts that could be done. I certainly wouldn't agree with that. We could go all day long with the things that you all could do, but with all due respect, I'm just here to clarify that the city make the best decision as representatives of all the time and effort before, and did we make the best decision as a community with the information they've given? That's what I'm here to do. With all due respect. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
it's rescinded, then there would have to be a motion to recommend a provider, a motion to do that. But because we had an appeal, then we want to say there's a motion to rescind it. Rescind well, the vote. Which I, have a question. I have a question uh, prior to, and i, I got to ask this um, prior to because I think it's pertinent. So, Basically, what what I'm what I'm getting and what I'm seeing is we have uh, three potential firms, one of which, uh, you know, according to what's been said, went above and beyond to go you know into the budget, make assumptions, etc., which I feel like a lot of the decision was made on. Do we have to pick? a candidate or a firm from the last pool or can we ask them give them clearer instructions on what we want and redo the process and that's why i said can we i didn't say that's what I'm, uh, before anybody gets excited can we go, can we do that no, I was thinking the same thing you were trying to say. I don't know what further, based on what I've heard from the city, they could do. I mean, I, as far as putting the process. Well, let me, let, me, let me answer your question. Yeah, absolutely. Council well, can do whatever it wants to do. The question you're going to come into is a, an issue of timing because we've got a January 1 renewal date. I understand. So, into consideration to take that into consideration. Well, I, I'm. Once again, I'm only one. I'm only one vote, so it, it doesn't really. You know, it matters what the majority thinks, not what the minority thinks. In most cases, up here. Do you think the process was incomplete, incorrect, or somehow flawed? For whoever I offended in my comments earlier, I apologize. Your decision does matter, but it's our behinds that get crucified in the paper and on Facebook and everywhere else whenever something goes wrong. So if well, it hits the sham, who gets it? Us or them? Well, uh, let's just let's just clarify that. Okay. So it was not the decision that is irrelevant. It was the fact that at the end of the day, we have to make decisions based on information that is given. Can everybody agree with at least that much? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my point is, I don't feel that right now, I would have made the same decision today that I made last week. And I don't feel that, in my opinion, maybe it put them at a disadvantage to see a lot of the, the extra lights and bells and whistles and all of a sudden maybe that shifted the conversation. I don't know. But I think at the end of the day, I made the recommendation before, I think there's a way to get around all that. and. Maybe that's, in my opinion, what should have been done. Maybe do a double blind. I mean, there's, there are ways to make sure that people don't get blinded by extra things that are asked for. Maybe it's basically if you ask for it, you get it. You compare the apples and apples. Like Jane said, we're talking about apples, oranges, lemons, pineapples, and hand grenades, like Jonathan said. So I would ask, is there, is there an opportunity for us to go back to the drawing board and figure out what that fair process needs to be? So that also, and let's face it, I can tell there's a lot of contentious feelings in this room uh, from staff towards what it feels like some of the you know current vendors, uh, etc. You know, there, there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of the process is going to be figuring out how to disassociate feelings from the process and just make the decision based on facts. So I, I just I feel like there are way too many unknowns to just move forward with just saying you know what let's rescind it, talk about it again, and then revote on it. Okay, I'm not sure that answered my question, which was where was the, you see a flaw in the process, where is the flaw? I, I, I don't know how else I can answer it again. I don't think I saw a flaw in the process. I think that what was presented basically was... There was a flaw in the presentation. I think we didn't get apples to apples. And why is that? Because the other two didn't present discounted numbers? <sighs> Phil, to, to put it simply, yeah, potentially, because you, there's a flaw in the process because, once again, talking about budgeted numbers, not actual claim numbers. So we're talking about pie in the sky based on pie in the sky. We're budgeting numbers, and they're saying they're going to do X. Those are two separate issues. Either the, the, their numbers, whether the accuracy of their numbers is one thing. Whether or not that information should have been presented by all three individuals is another thing. So, well, if, the other, if you're the questioning other their numbers, then, then no, that's no. where we need to focus. No, if you're the, questioning the, the, whether or not discounts should have been presented, that's a different question. The other flaw in the process, in my opinion, is 
if staff saw there was such a discrepancy in what was presented versus what was actually budgeted, I feel like it was staff's responsibility to come to us and say, this is actually what it is, not what was put here. Because we made the decision based off of what was up there. Okay. So again, you're, you're basing the decision, again, off of this graph, off of the numbers presented by Shaw Hankins. Correct. Do you have an issue with the fact that the other two did not present discounted information or discounts of any kind? That was not, they, they both individuals, when no, they stood up there, hold on, hold on, let me finish. Well, okay, both on. individuals stood up and said, we didn't know we could per had to present that information. And so that's a process issue. Now, if you're questioning their numbers, that's separate. So I just want to know which one is it, or is it both? And, and I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I asked that question. Okay. Number six of the RFQ says reviewing the employee benefit package for quality of benefits provided, cost effectiveness, competitiveness, and plan administration on an annual basis. I've been in sales before. As far as I'm concerned, we, you know, and this is, I understand there's a lot of money involved here, so that's why there's a lot of, this is not just about the upfront cost. They're making money off brokerage services. They're making money off commissions. They're making money off of reinsurance. They're making more money than just the little bit of money we're paying them directly. Would you all three agree with that? You're not just making money off the, 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 the upfront cost, that 50000 the 6000 a month, the 1000 a month, yes? I think exception to that. Oh, 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 oh. It's, a, it's, it's a yes or a no. Uh, no yeah. This is a discussion between you right. and I. No. Not, not the, the what I'm getting at is you have a sales presentation, you have an opportunity to make a pitch. And you know, part of being a salesperson or, a, or you know, dealing with clients is to look at the client, analyze the client, and maybe see things that the client doesn't even see for themselves. And if savings <laughs> is one of those things that you bring up, you bring that up. So if you didn't bring everything that you thought was pertinent in a two-hour presentation, you know, that's hard for me to, I, I don't want to be insensitive, but Says in the, it says cost effectiveness in the RFP, you could have presented that information. Even if you bring in accurate R RFQ. Now that's a separate instance. Now if they have misrepresented, if you're claiming that this I'm number is misrepresented, I'm, that's, then that's, that's, that's an issue in and of itself. I'm not saying they misrepresented the information. I'm saying they made they made calculations based off of projected budget. I, I understand. You're, you're mixing the two. I'm not mixing the two. I don't know what you don't understand. My my point still goes back to I don't feel that we have had a fair apples to apples. So my question originally was, and I'll state it again so you can hear it clearly, is there a potential for us throwing this out and getting a new process in place to do it again? Yes or no? We can, but do oh, we need that's to? All I need but to do we need to? All right, all right, that's all right, my question. Okay. okay, and I think this is to speak to both of your concerns. And I think Travis is absolutely right in one way. When he repeated that, I said apples, oranges, lemons, and pineapples. Because in this process, you're going to get apples, oranges, lemons, and pineapples because everybody's different. That's right. These three firms brought different things to the table. And to ask them to come back and bring themselves exactly as they were, you can't do it because it is different. Everybody has different <coughs> services, they have different programs, they have different projections. That's the way it is. So I think there's a fundamental decision that has to be made. What I'm hearing staff say is we wanted a firm that gives us tons of services and if we get a discount on the back side, that's, that, that's a great thing. That helps us offset the increased cost for these more services that we want. And it seems to me that Capstone and Shaw Hankins kind of fell in that basket. Over here on the other side is less upfront, and it appears to be just based on what I saw, less services. Doesn't mean that they're not enough services, just less. And they're on history of discounting off which you guys have had for over the last several years, correct? So the question is, at this point, it's really straightforward. What do you want? What out of all of this do you want? That's where we are. It seems to me that you guys on staff chose 
this is what you want for you and employees. Now as a council, we have to decide what do we want to pay for? What do you want? And that's the basic decision that has to be made. Who do you feel like will provide based on historically, based on presentations, the programming and potential savings that you want? Everybody can claim everything to a council. What do you want? Are you looking for us to make the decision today? I think you have to. I think you've got to decide we have appeals. Do you want to rescind? We have to ask for a motion based on the appeals that were made. Do you want to rescind the decision that was made by council? At the very least, that motion has to be brought forth because we have two folks out here who ask you to do that. Now going forward, once that's been done, if that does indeed happen, that could be for discussion going forward, but we will have to ask for a motion to appeal it, to rescind, to rescind the decision that was made. Court department. Thank you. So at this point, if there's no further discussion, I'm going to ask, do I have a motion to rescind the decision that was made to award the health insurance contract for the city of states for city employees to Shaw Hankins? Do I have a second? Second. Do I have any discussion? Yeah, I think we need to discuss this. Okay, there you go. Um, I mean, I think we need to, to, to look at, again, we have to look at the appeals. The appeals are based on, it seems like, two things, and I know they're connected, but they're separate. They're not identical. One is, we didn't know that we could provide discounted information during the proposal. If the appeal is based on solely that, in my opinion, you would deny the appeal. Why? Because part of your sales process is determining your client's needs and putting your best foot forward. And I gotta say, in any, if you don't know the city of Statesboro is a little bit cash grab, you don't know that we're a little bit price sensitive, Travis, you've been on this council for 10 years. If somebody doesn't know the council is price sensitive, then they do not know at least that end of the council for sure. Uh, so if it's based on solely, we were not allowed to present price discounted information. I think the appeals get denied because a sales pitch is a sales pitch. You wanna bring donuts or cheerleaders or confetti, that's your deal. You can, you can present it however you want. That being said, if it's more a concern about the accuracy of this particular information, I think that's legitimate because I do believe the council was influenced by the, uh, whether it was the whole decision or not, we were certainly influenced by the potential monetary savings um, that Shaw Hankins presented. So, I guess it really comes down to, in my opinion, if we're gonna hold up the appeal or do anything else, is do we feel that this information was um, accurate enough, or were we tr deliberately trying to be misled? Did somebody deliberately try to mislead us? So I think that's where it comes down to. Because if you didn't put it in your sales pitch, that you, you can't put that on the council, and you can't put that on the staff. You know, what if they didn't tell us about their website? You know, that's on them. So, but if this is about in inaccurate information, and you feel that the decision's been made on inaccurate information, that's a a different story altogether. However, Randy, you're also telling us that the discounted information was not used to determine the first rankings. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I would be careful about saying deliberately misleading because I think that information was pulled off. I'm not off. saying it was deliberately. I, mean, I, just, I would be a little careful because that was pulled off our website. Now, granted, it's not consistent. It's not real numbers. I don't numbers. think it was deliberate. I think it was yeah. inconsistent. Oh, okay. I think it definitely, as you said, it definitely shaped the conversation. And even though, once again, that was not used in the staff's proposal and the staff's recommendation, no matter what, at the end of the day, we, we at the last meeting, numbers, as you said, we are cash-strapped. We are basically in a position where numbers 
my opinion, now once again, my opinion, I think 70% of that conversation last time was about the numbers. Agreed. So if we're not making the decision on accurate information, then we need to go back and look at the whole decision. Any further discussion? All in favor? Please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay. The contract award is rescinded. At this point, we need to discuss how to go forward. Now, council is certainly within their purview. They certainly may make a motion to award it to another bidder. They may make a motion to table that and look at another process. At the end of the day, we still need to have health insurance beginning the first of the year. So, what, so, so, so whatever process you come up with, we need to be fast. Or you guys need to be fast. Uh, how is it even possible? I mean, your last RFP went out on July 23rd. Presentations work until September 7th. Uh, it's going to take at least the rest of the week to do an RFQ. I think that thing has to be advertised for at least three weeks, does it not? Two weeks at least. I mean, how are you going to be able to get that all done by the end of the year? Not possible. Not to mention the fact, I don't think January is when uh, a sign-up is. I think it's December, isn't it? Yeah, so we've got less than 60 days to do a 60-day process. So do we rush through it again just for the sake of time? I don't know. You were sending the vote. What's your recommendation? Hmm. Won't be quite as nice as that comment. Um, so basically, here's where we are. Uh, a lot of the legwork has already been done. Okay. I think there is a way for us to get it done. I think government moves entirely too slow for its own good. In most cases, we have 90 days to get that get that process effectively done. Um, no, uh, is it sign up is December first for healthcare. I know. If we don't have 90 days. Okay. okay. Um, is that possible? Mm, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not. Um, but we're here, so let's figure it out and not just say, oh, well, we got to pick the best house in a bad neighborhood because we didn't like it, so therefore we got to go back and do it again and just pick from what we got. I think there's, there's got to be a happy medium to how we get this done, whether it's through an extension, whether it's through, you know, uh, two months, two month extension, three month extension, whatever. There's got to be a middle ground. So my question is, what middle ground is there legally? What can we do? What can we not do? Well, I've got one thing I'd like to know. I don't know the answer to this. Is does it even have to be sent out again? That's another thing. Yeah. I mean, because you've awarded, you've, you've rescinded the award, and you've got three participants. So we're back thing. to the vote before the last meeting. Well, I mean, what would the process be with those three participants? If you wanted to, I mean, the process has already been done. Well, now that now that everybody knows everybody's cards, the process is going to be a little wanky anyway, because everybody knows everybody's laid it out there. Sean Hankins has laid everything out there to be to be the base. Uh, if, if if this would happen in a process that we were bidding out a sewer project or something like that, and we were having an issue like that, we would probably extend that out as long as we could. So, so things would change enough. So then it could be a fair bid because now to say we're just going to leave it to these three, when other companies around the state will be picking this up, there may be more interest now. They they they, they kind of know what the game is. So, so are we going to be shutting out possible firms who now have this have this additional information that they go, Ooh, I may I may want to go into stage growth. So I don't know if it's that 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 extension time that you look at. Or, or do we have to shot Hankins for a year and come back instead of having a, having a three-year agreement? We have a, a one-year agreement, if that's what they'd be willing to do. Those are those other kind of options that are out there. But that'll be up to you guys. But trying to get it done that quick and, and get everybody signed up, I think, will be, be difficult. So, so if you do anything, I think there's some kind of extension I can make. That's the least. What time frame of an extension would you look at? What would be 
things you'd be comfortable with, things like Marcos. You know, it does make things difficult when you award a bid and then you rescind it, which I don't know that we've done that. Not done it during my tenure. Um, because it does affect the bidding process. Yeah. I think the, I think the longer it is, the fairer it will be the next time it goes down. That would be my take on it. So, uh, uh, if again, I mean, uh, Attorney Travis, I mean, you, you I floated the motion to rescind this, so what is your idea for how we progress forward? Is there last thought about that yet? There's five other councilmen plus the mayor. I'm, I'm looking I'm for your idea. Well, I'm curious to hear your opinion. Now that we're here and we are where we are, are you going to sit over there and be obstinate, or are you going to actually, are you going to actually come up with a solution? Now who's being snide and disrespectful? All right, all right, all right. Understood. All right. I've simply asked you, you floated the motion. Did you think about a possible solution? And if so, what is it? I just asked what I, what my possible solution is, is to redo the process. Okay. Okay, so so now you have mine. So now what is yours or what are the other councilmen's ideas? Well, I, I can tell you that we're restricted by time because health enrollment is an annual thing that happens at the end of the year. Okay. It will be very difficult at this point to put out some kind of a new proposal and have that all done in time to, to for the December 1 sign up for health care. So now so you identify the problem, so let's find a solution. So what, what is your solution to that? Your problem solver, what's your solution? I'm, I'm sitting here thinking. Well, right? I, think the problem, I don't know. I, I hadn't thought of it until now because I didn't okay. think you were going to rescind the book. If I may, I think the, old, the, the problem is not just time from here to December 1st. Agreed. The time, there's also a significant time issue with the staff uh, being a part of any type of <clears throat> in two months period. Correct. And, and if you still want staff to be a part of the process. <laughs> you know, be a good one. Or, or for us to be a part of it. Or, or, or we've got a completely different different way to do it. And, and, and we do. We go get that third party consultant who we don't touch it. Somehow we, 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 we arrange a system where all that stuff goes to the third party. They don't. They don't have any of the angst and anything that's in the room. Let that be fairly done that way. I mean, that's just an idea. Because some some way we have to figure out how we're going to do this, and, and time is going to be tough. Well, I know. Everybody's vested interest. Does everybody? I mean, is there any issue with this thing remaining on a calendar year? What? I guess. I mean, is there any? I'm asking Jeff. Is there an issue with this remaining on a calendar year? Um, I know a lot of people are on calendar, but you know, a lot of people are not. They're on a fiscal year where they're in July 1. It could be. Okay. There's no problem with it being a July 1. Just until the ending this year. Yeah, that's where you're going to fall because you'd have to have an abridged stop loss contract to change it to a July 1. But at the same time, um, once you get the stop loss in place for the year, if you made a change, as long as the stop loss carrier was okay, you could make a change. So we're just be getting, getting an extension on that then. The move you're talking about is just getting six it's months. It's not an issue to stop loss here to do that. Hey, me. Yes. What I was saying is that um, you could, if you wanted to actually change your effective date, it would a little bit because you'd have to have an abridged contract and then have July be a new one, so it would be a weird, funky kind of thing. And generally what they'll do is actually make it a longer one for the next year, so it's actually two years before you change the effective date. The recommendation I would make would be to, um, especially if you're expecting to stay self-funded, is to go ahead and get your annual contract in place. If you want to make a move mid-year, all they, you know, if you changed it to a different broker or to a different TPA or anything like that, you just would need to get them approved with that stop loss carry, which should not be super difficult, and they would they would do a change mid-year. You know, it would just be for the service. So what I'm hearing you say is that if you contract it as is, continue, and then the decision was made April, okay, April 1, whatever, March 15th, 
to go to a, another brokerage, another insurance company, another person other than you guys, then it would just cancel the contract currently as is, or no. just re-sign with them. No, the contract, the stop loss contract would stay in place. Right. Um, it's just having approval from that stop loss carrier to work with the new DPA or broker that's going to be represented. The what the problem you will have is um, if you wanted to move to a fully insured. Um, that's where you're going to have any dollars you've accrued to your stop loss, you would lose basically because you would be jumping out of that contract and anything that you accrued into that. Well, I don't know that we're looking to do that. There's nothing right. I've heard that would suggest that. That's exactly. Right. So if you're so. planning on staying self-funded, then uh, it would just be a matter of that TPA or broker record or whomever is going to be represented in that process, but the TPA would more than likely have to be approved by that carrier. And that's not a good enough, probably a good enough process. Okay. I'm sorry, you said probably not a good process. It should be. I mean, it, I mean, I mean, I don't know who anybody else would bring to the table. You know, obviously, you know, they're working with the TPA that this particular carrier had a, a lawsuit with, and there could be problems. But typically, I mean, that would be the case. Yeah, so this isn't just, it's not like we just snap our fingers, you know, we've got a stop loss, we've got that toll, we've got uh, you know, the health insurance itself, we've got the, we've got trainer, trans, not transforming, we've got the health and wellness center. I mean, there's multiple contracts that work together. So it's not just as simple as just switching over to one or another. Okay, it could be done. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying it's not just we're switching over to one and everything switches over. That's there's a lot more contract negotiations out there than just this. Just to our brokers, that's just one company. Well, I think people want our business. I think it could be done. Clearly. <laughs> I mean, clearly. So there you go. Clearly. Can I, Sam, I'm sorry. Can I make a suggestion? I'm not sure of the time frame, though. The independent uh, person, uh, the independent agent, look at the, uh, the three that we have here now. And uh, I don't know what the time frame as opposed to putting it out there again. We already went through the process of uh, bidding it, so we have three people who will have to use it. Make the decision out of those three, but have the independent individual look at them. We can also give them a guideline so they can out and out for comparison as opposed to we have that. Is that possible? And if so, what the time frame would be if the independent person would be in play um, here to make out? Two weeks just to hire the independent person. I'll tell you what my concern would be about that. I don't think you're going to have anybody on this panel that's all going to ground who that independent person would be. And I don't mean that. Probably just to be straightforward. Yeah. So, yeah. Not to be brusque, but you, know, you don't ask your service brusque. providers to tell you who to use to recommend the service provider. You know what I'm saying? Like we, did, we don't ask the, the, they're here to give us service. We don't go and ask them, hey, who would you recommend to recommend you? You see what I'm saying? I so I'm not necessarily certain that they need to necessarily agree to who that third party is. I think that's for staff and council to determine. Well, that's who I was talking about. I wasn't talking about here. I was talking about here. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we got a couple options here. Let's talk through those. Sam brought up the fact that we want to just try to review, and I think that we may have, and I don't know, I'm going to the point over the case. Be thinking, because I'm coming back to you, um, an issue of would it be possible to have these proposals vetted by an independent party with no skin in the game, come back and make recommendations, and then vote. Think about that. Okay, we'll come back to you. Number. Number two would be, would it be possible to do an extension of the current provider and all that comes with that, either three or six months to March 31st, June 30th, something like that, it's an option, and then go back through the entire it, the process in its entirety again. What I'm hearing um, Randy say is that he would like to see that sit out a little bit to get rid of some of the perception that may come with an immediate rebid. And is that truly fair to those involved? So I heard your concerns on that. So we'll come back to that one in a minute. Kane, 
now that you've had a chance to pull that microphone over to you, uh, pull it a little closer. I know you just have a, an aversion to it, but. Are you talking about rejecting off the beds or just continuing to have an outside evaluator look over this? I love it would be a rejection. It would yes. just be a continuation of an outside evaluator. As long, as long as the bids weren't rejected, I don't care. We would not have to start over with that. Is that correct? I think if they stay as submitted and, and no elements change, I, I think we'd be able to say But if you put new qualifications and new objectives on it, I think then you have to go back out. Yeah, that's why I have to back up. So the question is, would the evaluator just look over the presented RFQs on this and not anything that's come after the submission to, um, to the city? Well, I mean, if, you know, if that individual had questions that they wanted to ask of the presenters, they could send them in writing. I'm just saying, without getting back up here, if they have further questions based on the materials they received and needed further information, I, would that be a problem? Elaborating on the material that's already been provided? That is correct. It if would that, not, it if would that not firm be, individual, whatever, wanted to do that, would that be a problem? Not as long as our RFQ remains the same, it should be fine. Then the, we, Otherwise, we need to reject all bids and start over from another source of um, qualifications. Hey, wouldn't that be additional information, though, that was not provided the first time through? It, I believe what Mayor's talking about was elaborating on material that's already been I understand provided. What you um, and I, I, I don't believe so, but Darren might have some more on that. I don't know. May I, before you come here, sure. um, just to be clear, you're not suggesting elaborate. You're, su you're suggesting a third party person the information that is already presented. And then if they have questions, emailing the individuals and allowing them to respond. The same, exact same questions, correct? Which is the proper way of doing it? Yes. The, uh, everybody has to see in my... I believe, I believe all right. Council and Yon is correct. I mean, if you're going to ask one questions, all three have to know the questions. That, that is correct. Oh, in, right. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bid, typically in a bid process. That is correct. Thank you for that clarification. So that's that's what Councilman Jones has basically suggested, right, yes. Councilman Jones? That's correct. Okay. So that's on the table. And the other thing would be, do we want to go ahead and authorize a May March 31st extension or June up till June 30th, and in the meantime we get it? Okay. I kind of see that as our two options at this point that have been brought forward by Council. Does Council have a third option? Okay, so I think we kind of have gotten some input on option two about extension. That seems like that's something that could be accomplished. Um, let's talk about Councilman Jones option one. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are in, in, in fairness to the three groups that, are, that were willing to present the materials that have come forth and to the staff that we can pursue that. I am a third party person that we can agree on to evaluate the material that has already been presented and let that see what the recommendation comes from. And so, just, just for clarification for me, are we trying to do that? I'll make that decision by the first of the year so we can move on or? I would think I'll have to be done for a recommendation to council by the first meeting of November if you're going to do that. If you're going to do that, that's what it has to be done by. And as complicated as this is for me and perhaps some of the rest of you, I think perhaps the insurance folks would agree that some of the knowledge of the industry can make a very difficult decision. Uh, Well, really, the question should be: If we push this decision to the beginning of November, what kind of pressure does that put on the HR department and and staff to implement this stuff in less than sixty days? We, we would, for open enrollment, I mean, TBR would have to do open enrollment. I mean, we're, we we started the time on open enrollment already, so um, we've already got to find out what week it's going to be, where it's going to be, times, all.
all that stuff. So Wait, when is that? That would change. I mean, that would be the we were going to do educational meetings the last week in November, and then do um, open enrollment for the first week of December. So in order to even meet that, my my point is, if they decide on something different, now you have less than thirty days to set up all that stuff. On. It, it probably have with to be, maybe a different provider. It have to be the current provider continuing open enrollment, and then behind the scenes, you guys are working on who the next provider is going to be, and that have to be exchanged in, in the new year. I will say this, and I don't want a response. Yeah that my gut would be that if a decision was made different from the current provider, they would bend over backwards to make that happen. That would be my, my thought. If. <coughs> if. So. Uh, just puts a lot of uncertainty on the, on the staff at this point. And, and, then, and then really puts their feet to the fire to get it done in a very short period of time. It's something that's complex, you know, this stuff is complex. You got family members, you got dental plans, vision, all kinds of stuff. To change all that in the course of 30 days is not. I completely appreciate what you're saying. And really, and, and put in simple terms, I mean, really you're just switching out the broker. So what we wouldn't do is, if we did it that quick, we would basically just do a switch out of broker. We wouldn't bring any of the ancillary products or anything like that to the market like we normally do, which we were trying to do, was bring it to the market, making sure that we get kind of our best bang for a buck for all the services that we have. So we would just kind of eliminate that part and just kind of do a switch out of growth. But that's really basically what we would do if, if we were to switch, you know, early next year. So it just be yes, from your season, <clears throat> not rush the process. Go through with open enrollment with TV. Let me stand up. What I'm saying is, if we do a quick process and a broker is named early next year, we wouldn't go to the market any, on any of our products. Right? It would be just basically you're switching the broker and they'd be over the current products and you know TPA at the moment. Um, just couldn't foresee us changing that kind of mid-year uh, with the employees and stuff like that. So we would just kind of have to work towards next year, kind of open enrollment and changing those things. So. so Jeff, just to be clear, what you're saying is any potential saving opportunities for any of the three groups would not be realized until a year from now. Pretty much long-term saving. Yeah, yeah. But just so we know, because the savings seem to be the need of the matter Absolutely. for us to critique short or fairly, we need to be very well aware of that. That's okay. correct. You wouldn't That's change the network. You wouldn't change the network. You might be able to negotiate specific medicines, but not That's the entire correct. network. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Independent analysis, move that way, make it work. Option two, extension, and rebid. That's what I'm hearing. And I still haven't heard option three. That's where we are. I move that we become a state trustee. I move that we go with the first option, which is the first party. Okay. Now, let me ask you. So if council decides to do that, that would be done by vote, correct? I mean, because that's not, we're not approving, we're not approving. <coughs> yeah, that would be, be approved by vote, but it would also be, we need to have some sort of mechanism that the person has chosen that grant authority to either a staff member or someone else to appoint that evaluator just so we don't have to come back in two weeks and ask for approval of this third party. Can I ask? Two councilmen to agree upon the evaluator. Yes. Okay. In that case, um, okay. you brought it up, Travis, the two of you. Would y'all be able to agree upon the evaluator? Jeff and I. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. There you go. Um, Mayor, for a second time, sure. and, and Jeff, would there be any? Would there be any reason not to extend it to June 30? and do the same thing. You're gonna... 
I'm just asking. Well, I, I do want to tell people that the idea that you're evaluating on Travis would be almost a year old. Okay. okay. Well, I'm, I'm just asking because Randy said if you want it good, it's not going to be quick. If you want it quick, it's not going to be good. And then Jeff and John's conversation, I'm just, I don't want to rush the process and then all of a sudden then we're back to square one because someone's been now questioning that process. Well, I think you're going to if you're going to evaluate the things that were submitted, then you might want to extend to March 31. Okay. <coughs> you see what I'm saying? I, I just mean, don't want to compress it and, for, and further exacerbate the problem. That, that, that's all I'm saying. Well, let's do that. I'll make a motion. You ready? Okay. i make a motion that we extend the current uh, provider to March 31st. And during that process, council um, finds an independent party to review the three bids that were given and make a recommendation to council going forward as to who to go with April 1st. So moved. Second. Do you have any discussion? Yes, I want to be clear that okay. this is based on the RFP, RFP, excuse me, RFQ packet submitted initially to the city. No additional information is based on the, the and, and I guess the reason I ask this is because it, it, it's are we are we questioning the process or are we just questioning the decision? Because if the process was good and everything everything was good with the process, but the presentation of information wasn't exactly accurate, then then, uh, then it makes sense to go back and make the decision off those our RFQs. If for some reason the process was flawed, then we should go back and change the process. No sense making the decision if the process was bad on the same information. I, hadn't heard that, I haven't heard that the process was bad. I have not heard complaints about that. I haven't either. So, I mean, I'm just speaking from my perspective. So, but I mean, that's the question that needs to be asked. I do think, I, I do think it's, it's the material submitted, mm -hmm. anything else submitted, and then if that individual, that firm would like to ask the same question of every one of the members, they can submit additional questions. That's up to them. And then they can come back and make a recommendation. So we're, we're basically looking for a third party just to kind of review the staff's recommendation and, and to make their own recommendation. <coughs> Based on the RFQ submitted, of course. That is correct. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, I'll favor the state by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries.
He doesn't want to build it. Thank you. I'll just assume not leave. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just really very quickly, uh, we always like to try to have something positive at the end of these meetings about staff. Uh, we had two officers at the police academy over the last uh, 11, 12 weeks, and one of them was named the class president of his academy class, which is a, a, a vote by the, the staff there on the person with the best leadership potential, who has displayed the best leadership of the class, uh, and that was one of our newest officer, uh, Jacob Stansel. So we're pretty proud of that, and I just thought I'd pass that on to you.